As she mentioned, you know, I brought TED to India in 2009, and the idea was I was just going to come here, do one conference, and go back. I mean, I had no intention of moving to India, let alone live here, have a career here. And, and the only reason I also did that was TED.com was launched in 2007 or so, and the talks were kind of going viral. And I was the only Indian who spoke on the TED stage for a like three-minute talk. And I thought that was ridiculous. There's so many amazing people in India with great stories, and they're not being told. And being away from India, when you live outside India, the only stories you hear, now I'm talking in the 80s and 90s, it's changed a lot today. 80s and 90s, the stories you hear are, um, okay, you know, there's, there is uh, elephants, there is this, there's this exotic India. Of course, I landed in Portland, Oregon, where there's 92% white population, where everybody thought I had the perfect skin color and I had the most beautiful name. And I thought I did, died and went to heaven. You know, going from South India with a name like Lakshmi, where everybody says, if you're only a little fair, you could have been easy to get married. To move to a place where everybody thought I had the perfect tan and had a unique name was just perfect um, for me. But, you know, living there, the stories you hear again are this very exotic type. You know, the yoga, the gurus, the mantras and all this stuff. Or it is, oh, they're taking our jobs, etc. It's not because people are ignorant. It's because we've not been telling our stories. We did not take the time to tell our stories on the right platforms. So I felt if TED was going viral, if it was becoming popular, we should put a bunch of Indian stories on TED. And that's why I came here. So we put Pranav Mistri's story. It became hugely viral, and he became one of the most talked about guys. A guy with a very Guju accent coming and talking about cutting-edge technology was fantastic. He was not trying to be anybody else. He was himself. And, uh, but there's one incident that happened there that showed me the power of this, uh, it takes a village. So we had over 60 speakers, and everybody, we had dancers and writers and musicians, and everyone was there. So there was also Sunita Krishnan. How many of you know her? Okay, so Sunita runs an organization called Prajwala. It rescues women out of prostitution and gives them a home. She's been doing it for a long time, okay? An amazing woman. I mean, just one of the most powerful women I ever met in my life. So she comes to the conference, and we, you know, kind of talk to each other. And then I said, you should give a very tough talk. Don't mollycoddle things. Don't say, you know, this is what happens. Because partly, you know, it, it's a double-edged sword for me. Partly, I don't want to show India like that. I don't want to show India like this, uh, you know, kind of where so much trafficking is there. But the truth is, it's everywhere, OK? It's nothing about India that's special. So I said, but you need to give a very hard-hitting talk about what does this mean? And she gave a very hard-hitting talk. She talked about women who've been tied to their beds for 10 years, 20 years, where 50, 60 men rape them every day. She talked about the youngest child they rescued is like three years old. And I mean, it was like, you know, gut-wrenching talk. And then she said, this is not a problem of the prostitutes or the pimps. The problem is with us. When they come back, we don't want them back in our houses. We don't want them working for us. Even the people who donate money to us say, hey, I want, I'm looking for somebody to work for me, but not one of our girls, OK? So the problem is with us. So that was her talk. And uh, so I asked her at the end of it, if I could ask you, what's the one thing you wish you had? What would it be? She said, you know, we don't have a permanent home. Whichever neighborhood we are in, we get kicked out because nobody wants us in that neighborhood. I just wish I had my own home so I don't have to move anywhere. I mean, it was just a very casual conversation. And I just asked the audience, what do you think we should do about it? So one woman put her hand up and said, I will give $10,000 if nine others sign up right now. 20 people signed up right then and there. But the issue is, we all get emotional. We all get, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then we go home and life happens, right? So what? opened my eyes to is we took all their names and I personally contacted all of them and we worked at them. Then I talked to Megan Smith who was running Google.org at that time. She gave the largest ever grant for this. We worked at it for four months. So 18 months from the time she gave a talk on the stage, 
we raised enough money for her to build this on a 10-acre campus outside Hyderabad. And it's just, it's just took a village. None of us could have done it. I didn't contribute a single penny to this. I mean, I did, but not the amounts that most of the people gave. It's, it's got a home. This is what it looks like. If you get a chance, you should go outside Hyderabad and see. They have an amphitheater. It's unbelievable. She and her husband put everything aside. They took the money and personally built this. So this is what it takes a village. When everybody puts their mind toward it, huge actions could come out of it. So what that opened my eyes to is that it's not about telling great stories. It's about following it up with action, which is exactly what you're doing here. And that's what causes a huge change out there in the world. Thank you.